thank you very much for having me. Um, first about me, I'm a freelancer developing stuff on top of databases, mostly Postgres, sometimes derivatives of Postgres. And well, it turned out to me that uh, this thing is very nice to have, so that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, I start with a story about SQL MED. Uh, I first covered that on a conference uh, of Postgres Europe in Amsterdam several years ago. And at that point, I just left a medical company and I thought that MED would be mean medical. And I said, well, not interested anymore, skipped it. Uh, the following year, I attended FOSTEM. And FOSTEM is only one dev room at that time being. So there was only one track after another. And I took a look at what this would mean, and it turned out it didn't have to do anything with medical data stuff. It just mean management of external data. And that made me curious, and I started uh, playing around with that stuff. Um, by the way, I published that talk later on. If you have any questions, that just stop me at any time. And uh, the publish talk will have links, all this uh, blue stuff over there. All that is that blue is a link to an explanation or a download or whatever it is to give you further information about what I'm talking about. So let's start. That is the first definition of SQL MED, and it was revised with that one. They are both available, and you can just view them, and they are for free. You don't have to pay for them to, uh, to get them. So that's a good thing, because most of the ISO things are expensive. And these kind of things are supported by some databases. Uh, the first one is DB2. That is also implemented very good in there. The second one is MariaDB, obviously not implemented as uh, mentioned in the standard. It's very different, it's just made with storage engines, and it's very complicated and not very helpful, but they claim they have it. And obviously, Postgres. So that's a good thing. Let's speak about the implementation. In Postgres, the implementation is done with a thing named foreign data wrapper. Uh, FDW usually in shortcut, so that's how you find it. You have read only once, but you only have once where you have read and write capabilities. That means you can write into an external data source, which is really funny and helpful sometimes. The foreign data wrapper are installed as extensions into the database, so that makes it easy. We all know how to handle extensions. Obviously, some of them will not work on managed services, but that's the problem with all extensions. So let's go about some of the available database, uh, available foreign data wrappers that uh, we can already use. Uh, there is an Oracle foreign data wrapper that is available over PGNX.org. Um, oh, and the Oracle is read and write, so that is Going back, uh, that's where I first started with. I started with uh, the Oracle one. It was already implemented with writing at the time I started uh, using it. And I used it for an Oracle cluster connecting the data, doing some operation on the data, and writing the data back to the Oracle database. And it was really just a virtual machine with standard Postgres con uh, configuration. Nothing changed. And the fun fact was the Postgres database was faster than doing that job directly in Oracle, which was really fun to show that to other people, because you could repeat that. It was always the same. Uh, nearly two times faster doing the same stuff in Postgres and writing the data back into Oracle, which is horrible, but well, it did that way. Um, then we have the MS SQL Server and Sybase Adaptive Server Enterprise. They are read-only currently. And they are still working, even if they switched away nearly 20 years ago. Um, because in the beginning, MS SQL Server only was a fork of Sybase, for those who didn't know. That's the funny part of it all, when they came back to Linux, because 
it was already running on Linux for more than 20 years. The Adaptive Server Enterprise was one of the first databases available on Linux at all. And then there is also, next funny thing, there is a MongoDB that is available on GitHub. And also that has some sort of a story because there are currently there are two available. Uh, one is really done by MongoDB itself because some years ago they decided to need an BI adapter because usually BIs can't handle their uh, BSON data type. So they needed something that was able to transfer the data into something that usual BI systems could read. And they discovered Postgres has foreign data wrapper and they implemented their BI adapter as Postgres reading MongoDB. Um, then there is also two Mariah MySQL ones. They are still supporting both versions, even if they are started to go apart. And there is one on PGNX.org, which is outdated and old. You shouldn't use it anymore. There is a newer one on GitHub. And then there is also an SQLite that is on PGNX.org. And there is another one on GitHub, which was the first one, but uh, that isn't supported anymore. Um, it, but it's still there. So, and the new one supports on PGXN, uh, PGXN org. That one supports also write statements. So you can write into that. And if you have to use a Hadoop cluster, that is read-only, there's also one available. The advantage is you don't need that stupid language anymore. You can just query and Hadoop cluster with standard Postgres SQL. Because the fun fact is, it translates everything for you. It does even if the foreign data wrapper has implemented it, it does even uh, do a group by push down. That, that does mean that the group by is done on the other server, not on Postgres side. Also, where clauses are pushed down. So they are working on the other side as long as only data from the other server is involved. There is an ODBC one, and there's also one on PGXN, which is an active, an active development, so use that one on GitHub. And there's also a very funny thing, funny sort of, because it makes sense. There's one for Apache Kafka, which is read-only because uh, writing to Kafka from Postgres didn't make sense for the company that did that, it's a Berlin-based company. Um, and you can just read Kafka statements right into your database and from your database without any client software involved. There are some special foreign data wrappers that you could use. There is a file foreign data wrapper that is very handy. We will see that later on. Uh, there is a Postgres foreign data wrapper. So you can connect to other Postgres databases and query other Postgres databases, no matter where they are. The only thing you need, you need to be able to connect to that server. If it's local, if it's external, it doesn't matter. Uh, I personally had to try it out even with a very old version of Postgres. Uh, last year, I had to work with a very old Postgres database. At the beginning, it was very old. It was on 8.4, and I was querying it from Postgres 10, and it did work. It didn't throw any failures, and it just worked. That was very surprising, but very cool. Then there is some foreign table exposure extension, because some BI systems have problems identifying the foreign tables as tables inside Postgres. So that solves that problem with some BI systems. And then there is the possibility that you simply write your own ones based on Multicorn. Multicorn is an extension for Postgres that already has some things implemented. So you can already use 
IMAP and HTML, so you can query from Postgres directly into IMAP email or HTML. So I'm using some database uh, that is available uh, on, on GitHub. That is a Chinook database. It covers some sort of music stuff. And uh, during the talk, I will use Postgres, comma-separated files, SQLite, and MariaDB, and also something that is not on Chinook, but later more to that. So the Chinook tables that we are using, there are more we are only using than the artist table, which is short, a table name with, uh, with the albums. So we're getting data from, from album data, and we have tracks on an album, usually, minimum one. And then you can categorize what music that is on that album. So that's simply what we will use as tables from the Chinook database. And it is available for several databases, so you can just use them. And they are free. So let's start with the fun part. And we now make foreign data wrappers work. So first of all, I just scroll a little bit up. Uh, there is, uh, at the beginning, you see uh, which foreign data wrappers I will be used, and the extensions, and they're also linked. So I also will publish all the statements that I'm using here. They will be on GitLab and GitHub. I post that on Twitter later on. And uh, so you can use it on your own and play with that stuff. And it has some uh, drop extension in it for everything because it makes it easier if you're playing around with uh, this data stuff. So we start with simply creating the extension for the SQLite database. So that just creates the extension. Probably need a little bit more space. Yep, that should. So now we need to tell Postgres how to access the SQLite file. So the file is, come on, the file is over here in a folder. And there's one important thing that you need to notice. Not only does the Postgres user, the user in which context Postgres is running, which is usually Postgres on Windows, uh, on Linux, um, that user must have read writes on the file itself. And if you have to write into SQLite files, you also need to have the right to uh, everything on the folder. That took me a while to find out that stuff. But in the end, I found that failure. So you just give, them enough, give the Postgres user enough writes on, on the folder and the file, and then you can write into the database. So the thing is here. It doesn't check anything. It does only check if uh, the foreign data wrapper is available. That's everything that it does check. So if the file doesn't exist, there won't be any error when you're creating this foreign data wrapper server. So, but that worked. So we create just a schema to store some SQLite stuff in there, inside the Postgres database. And so here we go. And uh, that is how we create a foreign table based on that. So what you see here is the server that we have created recently. And it's create foreign table over here. Then it is schema name. So I choose, I've chosen the same name as the original one. And the original one comes with uppercase letters in column names. So that's how it is. And for the next information, you have to give Postgres the knowledge what the primary key on the other side is, because then it can write to the other database in that case. So in this case, it's uh, the artist ID and name. And there is then the SQLite server 
That is a foreign data wrapper that we recently created. You can still see it down there. And then there is an option, and the option says that we want to have the table artist so that Postgres knows which table on the other side it should use. Let's see. So that worked, but even that doesn't do anything. It doesn't check a single thing. It only will fail if something went wrong when you try to query it. That's the first time you see if it does work or not work. So that query just ran from Postgres through SQLite and got some data from there. So now start with the funny thing. So we can update some data. And it just did it. So it was the artist ID one. Where is there is the SQLite? So let's see. So ACDC is now that's the artist ID one, and it's now in lowercase letters. So it just did it. So let's see it on the Postgres side and see it there. So we can change it back to the original one. Query it, you still see it here. So running the query, not that way. And it's uppercase letters again. So we've written into an SQLite database file, which comes very handy at several times. So we also check if it did it here, it did. So that's nice. So now we start with the next extension. We create one for a MariaDB, where the extension is MySQL foreign data wrapper. So first you need to create the extension. Now you have to create the foreign server. And the foreign server has a little bit more information than what we previously had, because that was only a file. Here we have a host and we have a port. So that is the needed option to tell Postgres where the server is located. And now comes another thing, because how could that MariaDB know who we are when we're querying the other side? So we need to do a user mapping. So for the user that is querying MariaDB from Postgres, uh, the Postgres user needs to know what's on the other side. So that's what we are doing here, a user mapping. <clears throat> Then I create a schema and let's see. So here we just create the schema and we don't have to specify the key because uh, with that foreign data wrapper, um, we get that directly from the foreign data wrapper. So where there is no need to define the key, but you need to do that with the SQLite one. But here it's just... Uh, the same as before. In addition, you now have a database name because uh, MariaDB has database names, what's uh, schemas in Postgres, and uh, the table name. And here again, you need to do the wrapping of the data types. So you have to take a look at what's, what the other data type is. So what's the data type in MariaDB? What is the appropriate uh, data type in uh, Postgres? It's very easy with MariaDB, but it becomes scary when you have to use uh, Oracle or SQL Server. That's more difficult. So even here, it doesn't check anything as before. We only see if that worked, if we selected some data. So we queried some data directly from a MariaDB. But what we now can do, we are running on Postgres. So what we now can do is we can join tables from MariaDB and SQLite in one statement on a different database. So that now is, it is becoming more sense what we are doing with foreign data wrapper because you can just join them, put them together and get the data out and do whatever you like with that. So I also promised that this one is uh, write capable, so we start with that one, just for fun. We take that album with ID1 and 
Let's see on the MariaDB. And MariaDB set updated by Postgres. Very nice. Going back, querying the same from the Postgres database, and it tells us the same as it should be. So now we can set it back. As I have uh, Chinook database also installed on that Postgres 11 installation that uh, we are running on here, um, I can update the MariaDB database with the data from the local Postgres database. And it just worked because it should now say again the right name of the album. And it does. So, same over here, and we return to the original name of the album. So the next one is I create the Postgres foreign data wrapper extension to query some Postgres data. Obviously not the local one, obviously another one. So I have currently three Postgres installations on this uh, notebook. Uh, the latest one is 9.6, so we are using 9.6. And uh, here you see there's a little bit more than we had before because uh, we have the host, the pod, and the database name over here to connect to the external uh, Postgres database. But it's the same as before. It doesn't check anything. And we also need a user mapping over here because that 9.6 Postgres server doesn't know anything about our local user. We just need to tell that database that who we are when we pass a query. That's done with the user mapping again. And now we create a new schema for that one. And now you will spot a difference uh, on importing t uh, tables from Postgres databases. The difference is I can say not to not import table, I can import a foreign schema. I can just name the schema name, and then I can have a limit over there with a two, and then I can mention all the tables that I want to have, which is much easier than doing a statement for every single table, which you had to do with SQLite and uh, the other ones. So that is much more handy, but it's some sort of Postgres installers. So let's see. Well, that worked. We are able to create, to select some data from there. And now we are joining three sources together. And we have an external Postgres, an external SQLite, and it just works. And the MariaDB, obviously. I should have put it in the comment, but forgot it. So we can join everything on now four databases involved. So let's go. Let's go with the file foreign data wrapper. We create the extension first. We need to create a server even for a file. It does need a name to access it. I create a schema again. So, and what you see right here is you need to tell Postgres the data types that are in that CSV file. That's very easy. And uh, then everything that comes here, file name, format, header, that's everything that you know from copy. So it's the exact same syntax when you are using foreign table to access files, CSV files, or JSON files. Uh, as it is when you are importing them with copy. It's exactly the same. Even that doesn't do anything, just create something inside this Postgres database. Let's see. So that selected some data from a CSV file. So now we join all this together, so we have now some more. And even that worked sort of fast enough, 42 milliseconds is somewhat okay for having four external databases involved and having a fifth one 
displaying us the data, returning the data. So as we had the previous talk from uh, the other Stephanie about materialized views, I can skip explaining anything about it because she already has done this. Uh, I just create a materialized view because that is what you usually do when you uh, are querying external data. Um, that is for, especially for BI systems, then very handy because <clears throat> you can add indexes that you need for your queries on that, <coughs> that data, and it doesn't query the external data anymore. It just queries uh, your local Postgres database. So everything then is local in that materialized view. It's a little bit longer with a group by and sort of. So that is a little bit faster than the other ones because even with uh, counting and so on, because it's only three milliseconds, so that's Postgres. Now it becomes fast, even without an index. So now we start with the next one. The next one is Multicorn. Multicon said that we can access HTML. Well, let's see. We need to create a foreign server as usual. Same with files. It doesn't have any other usage. Just to tell it uh, that it should use the Multicon wrapper. That's all that you have to pass over there. So the thing here is what I'm current. What I'm now doing is I'm will query RSS feeds with Postgres which sounds funny at first, but these are music feeds, so we can later on try to join them against the music data tables that we already do have. Uh, there are some things that you need to know about uh, the RSS feeds and implementing that. That is, the names over here have to be exactly the names that are in the RSS feed. So you have to control the RSS feed first for the naming and the column names of the RSS feeds because you need them then over here exactly in that way as they are coming. So, and then you just give them the correct data types that you're expected them to be. And then you have to give as a server option, you have to give the HTTP or HTTPS address, whatever it is. So, and that does as before, just nothing. Now let's see if we can query the web. It takes a little bit longer, but that is an RSS feed directly received from the internet, shown in Postgres. So as we have one, we can take a little bit more. There's another one. So we create the next one. Oh, no, that was, sorry, I skipped that. I wanted to query uh, the table with, uh, with the Chinook database with the RSS feeds. So we can get data from both and link them together now. That's what I promised uh, before I started uh, skipping it. Uh, so we can just join them together now and we can use whatever we want. We can use I like, we can use uh, whatever is available. So I create another foreign table with some music data. See if it does work. That doesn't come with any data. Shit does happen. So that will be empty. But there are more. That one delivered some data, and there is another one. See if that does deliver something. Yeah, that does also deliver something. So, and we are back to materialized views again, because I created a materialized view. And uh, with, with a union over for, for every single foreign RSS server. And you might notice that I put on here a row number. Uh, come to that later on, because that's the only difference to the original table. And 
I create some materialized view because that has to query all the RSS feeds. It takes a second longer. So you see all the union and the next union, and it's finished. And what we are now doing is we create a unique index that will help us further on to refresh the materialized view concurrently. You can even use really calculate columns in, uh, in a materialized view. So here is the row number, and we use the source because both together are a unique key. So, created the unique key and joined some data. And you see now it's lightning fast. Not that lightning fast because there is no index and it's a complete like stuff over what all it, what all it is. But it does querying much faster than before. And it doesn't access the internet anymore because everything is running now on this local Postgres database. So now that we have this stuff ready, we can go up for the next stuff. You've already seen that Stephanie mentioned PG Chrome. So we use it just here. We create the PG Chrome extension. And just for fun, I create a log table. And I create a procedure. And in this procedure, I'm querying the material, I refresh the materialized view and just insert something into that log. You can extend it with something, there is uh, no failure handling, no error handling implemented. That's something that you usually should do when you're doing it that way. So if something fails, that you can get noticed and that it's much easier to see what happened. Uh, you can also obviously use. Uh, Tail, oh, it wants my password, obviously. It's not secret, it's a window, it's, it's a Linux password. It's not secret. So you can even see here what's going on. So what we now do is we create a schedule. So what you need to know, if it runs on uh, localhost with uh, PG Chrome, don't put a name in here, just leave it empty. Otherwise, uh, it will not work. Um, it isn't documented and it took me some time. It might be an issue because this is Postgres 11 I'm currently using. And uh, on PG Chrome, it's only mentioned that it doesn't work with Postgres 10, but it did work, so why not use it? So let's see. So here you with that, with that select statement, you can see what's in the PG Chrome table. And uh, you can even see the Chrome job is active. That's the first one. It will run every minute. And it will call a procedure, which is something that was known in Postgres 10. So at some point, we could also see. See, here we are. So some minutes, seconds ago. There was a refresh on that foreign data sources. We should also see that here. Yeah. And even here, you see in the log that the job is uh, creating. And there is one thing that returns malform XML. So that is probably the RSS feed that returned no data. They changed something. Uh, on their format or might have changed the address and just uh, deliver shit now, whatever it is. Uh, you can see that in the log files if you scan the log files. Or you could use some failure handling and we see that the Chrome job just started again, comes up with malform XML for something and says it's completed again. We should see it here. Yes, there it is. So that's the second one. So Stopping them, we can just, and that's another good thing, we can query now that one as long as we want and, and as often as we want because the refresh is running concurrently. So we unschedule that now because uh, otherwise this notebook will just query the internet. And last but not least, I will do create another foreign table. 
and query that data. So that should be done. Here it goes. Um, and here you see all upcoming Postgres events in the correct order. And uh, I removed uh, with a really silly function that you shouldn't use in production. I removed all HTML stuff that is included usually in here. Uh, so I stripped the text there. But now you can deliver uh, your coworkers with information about the next upcoming Postgres events by RSS feeds in uh, a dashboard, for example, just for fun. So that's, that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much for the amazing talk. Uh, did you try yeah. to explain some joins, some selects uh, between? Yeah, they are this? coming up with an ex with uh, with an explain that tells you that some foreign data source is involved. It shows you, but it comes up with uh, with uh, the information that uh, the data is uh, from a foreign data source, and it also mentions where it does come from. When you query it, you see it in the query. So for the join of data from five different sources, um, where does the join happen in the memory of which server? Well, that join is then done on the local server. That can't be done on the remote server, so it's all done locally. Yeah, so it's from it the got, calling gets the side. Data, yeah, yeah, it gets the data and joins them together. That's okay, a, this is what I also thought, but wanted yeah. to verify. So you showed uh, very good performance, but then the question comes when the tables have uh, billions of rows, how does it work then? Um, it does still work, even with bigger tables. So the Oracle database that I mentioned was a cluster with some terabytes. But that you, I you from do fetch um, millions of rows from the remote sites? Uh, or? You usually don't fetch everything. You don't do what I did right now. Uh, just fetch everything. You usually have uh, a wear condition, so the wear condition is pushed over. Yes, yeah, so the filtering is done on the remote server. The filtering side, is done so on the remote server and you only get the results. So what you also can do, for example, with, with Oracle, you can query uh, prepared materialized views from, uh, from an Oracle cluster and you get the prepared data already ready to consume and not do that on the Postgres side. But sometimes if you might to, you have to and then put it into a materialized view and uh, be happy. So you have this set up somewhere working in a real business yes. case? All right. um, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's possible um, to use that system in order to uh, analyze uh, HTML files uh, because uh, you, you saw that it's possible with the RSS feeds, but do you think it's possible to to say uh, to Postgre to fetch an HTML uh, page and to use our RSS. You can fetch an uh, you can fetch an HTML page and uh, then go through that data and uh, do whatever you like with the HTML page. So you can also add a Gmail account because Gmail has an IMAP okay. ready, so you can query your IMAP on Gmail with SQL and join them with uh, data in your SQL database. That's possible and does work. That does multicorn directly out of the box. So it could be a solution for a scrapping system, in fact? Yes. And uh, w what would be the extension for uh, this kind of usage? Uh, it's, uh, it, it, what is the extension to use if you want to do that? Uh, the extension is multicorn. Multicorn, okay. And multicorn, multicorn is... Uh, Simply just available. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks for the talk. Uh, if you try to join two tables from the same remote server, uh, does it push the join condition to the server? or does That it do depends on the implementation of the foreign data wrapper. Okay, thanks. Some do, some do not. <laughs> it's, 
you can do that. It's possible. If you, you can write your own one. Uh, you can write them with Python. You can write them because with Multicon, you're able to write your own ones uh, in Python. So if you don't want to do them in C, you can do it in Python, which is slower, but for a lot of people, much more handy. And um, what you do, what you define in your foreign data wrapper inside your code, that is, there are a lot of things that are available, but you have to use them in your code to access and uh, to give that information, to push it down, to make it visible for Postgres, and to push it down to the external data source. So, for example, with the uh, MySQL MariaDB stuff, what it currently does not is it does not uh, handle any JSON stuff in MySQL, that foreign data wrapper. That, that's just not implemented. But at least as it's originally implemented as a check constraint, you can just get the data over as text and convert that to JSON on the Postgres side. So it, it really is that you have to look at the foreign data wrapper itself, what it is capable of. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. What is your opinion on using this technique to bridge uh, Postgres, or build a bridge between Postgres and other systems that do keep data, but not necessarily in a real relational format? So uh, graph databases, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, I don't know, something else that you would typically want to keep in sync somehow? Is this well, the right approach or is it Elasticsearch is not a database for me, it's a search engine. And I've seen it often used as a database, exactly. which is simply wrong. Um, Hence my and question. it's a stupid it? solution, but it doesn't help. I've seen it very often when there have been no index on the databases and the database, database became slow. They decided to use, uh, to put the data into Elasticsearch to make it available over there because it's so much faster. And uh, after some proper indexing, uh, it was slower. Okay, I'm maybe Elastic not Elasticsearch, but a graph database. Would this be an interesting approach or, it's, or is this the I don't know if it's, if it's for you. If it's interesting for you, there is even a GraphQL extension for Postgres so that you can query Postgres with graph language. Okay. So it depends what you like. There are a lot of things available. And I don't know if there are foreign data wrappers available for graph databases, but if not, implement them. Uh, yeah, but my question was mostly, is this the right thing to do? What's your opinion? It depends on the use case. So. For example, if you're able to push into Elasticsearch uh, for being a search engine and you have a foreign data wrapper that can do that, that might help much more and might be much faster than implemented in some interface in between the two because uh, you have to read it from one, so one source, put it in, move it over to the next one. That might be helpful, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering if there is uh, other projects that can do such amazing things like that. Other projects. Uh, there has been in earlier times for Postgres DBLink, which was used to access external data. Uh, I won't recommend it anymore. If it's in still in use, don't switch it because it's still working. Uh, but uh, when you are starting fresh with Postgres, that's the way to do with other data sources, it's as simple as I said, there is only DB2 supporting it completely in that way as a database. And with everything else, it's uh, an ETL tool then that you put in front of it. So one of this big Java stuff things, uh, I don't name them. Um, they need their own server. They need uh, their own high memory and they are querying then everything, and uh, you are doing the jobs in there. That is the only possibility. You can also put a Postgres instead of a Java stuff inside all your connections, and putting the data together and writing them, for example, to another Postgres database to not uh, do that on the same database. Even that is possible, because you can obviously write into other Postgres databases. That even worked with 8.4. 
So, um, do we still have the same uh, data consistency guarantees uh, that we have on a plain, uh, on a Postgres SQL without resorting to the foreign uh, data wrappers? Like, for example, uh, updating a row from uh, you, uh, by using the foreign data wrapper in Postgres SQL, while at the same time somebody else is updating the same row from another database. It behaves oh. like a client uh, that, like a usual, usual client to that external database. Okay, so, so you retain all the data. Everything that's going on is just a push down. You just send, like an, from an application, an update, insert, delete, whatever it is. Send it over there. It's executed over there, and that is all handling handled by the other side, not by Postgres. Okay, great. Thanks. You're welcome. Do you know why the um, Microsoft SQL Server foreign data wrapper is not working in write mode? In what? In, in write, write mode? No, it doesn't work in write mode. Okay. I would have mentioned that. It only does yeah. work in read mode. Do, do you know why? Because it's not implemented. Oh, okay. uh, I think, <laughs> well, uh, as far as I know, oh. Yeah, it's done by EDV. I know that it's done. The community version, the, it's in beta, okay. beta 3. I think it's doing some kind of rights or something. Well, some customer has to pay for it to implement it because otherwise nobody would touch SQL servers. <laughs> pay me for using it and pay me for doing stuff on it and then I might do it yeah. or not if I don't like to. <laughs> but that is, uh, if it's not available, it doesn't mean it isn't available. It only means it's not implemented. It can be implemented. There are several ways. Do it on your, on your own, do it yourself. Uh, buy someone to do it or give money to a company who usually does this. For example, Second Quadrant, EDB, and Dalibo. And they are all doing this kind of things. So if you need that, you can get that, but you might have to pay for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.